Andrew. Yeah, it is. It is. It's Friday again, and a different time than normal again. Always a different time, Keith, with you. September the twenty fifth, ten twenty one. That was the week that was. It was another week, Keith, dominated by IPOs and SPACs. Uh, so we're, before we start with the specific news, just for me, who, who as most people know, is not quite as sophisticated as you. Uh, what is the difference between an IPO and a SPAC? How, how does the SPAC replace the IPO? Well, funny you should ask that, Andrew, because I've got a graphic that we can use to explain it. It's, it's going to obscure your face for a short while. Um, it's better so, than that. so ba basically, um, all, all of the various methods are ways of going public. That is to say, different ways of being listed on either the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. Which is essentially a way of raising cash. Extra cash. Uh, it's a way actually of trading. It isn't always a way of raising cash. That's only true in one of these scenarios. So, so the IPO is a way of raising cash by going public. And the way it works is you, you engage bankers. The bankers and you set the price of your shares. Buyers buy the shares for the price you set. You get the cash for the shares you sold. And then the IPO trades and it prices... Uh, as people buy and sell it. In the case of Snowflake, the buyers bought shares for $120 each. It traded at $245 when it opened. So those buyers were immediately uh, double their buy price. And, um, uh, what, uh, and so the investors who bought before the IPO made a lot of money. That's that's basically an IPO in the company. And yeah, that includes that. the banks. The banks are the, 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 the major players in, in the IPO program. Yeah. In, in the case of Snowflake, it was Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and a couple of others. But they are taking the risk and they, they do have the capital to do this. It's not an easy well, thing to... Well, yeah. Out. The bank plays the role of underwriter. But in, a, in, in most scenarios, that's a risk-free role. Um, what they're really doing is selling shares to people like Fidelity, for example. And um, the banks get 7% of everything they sell as their fee, and the rest goes to the company. Uh, you can negotiate around the 7%, but normally it's 7%. So a SPAC is, is different. Um, in a SPAC, someone like Chamath goes out and raises $600 million. He lists the SPAC. In fact, you can go and look it up now. It's called IPOC, um, and, and it's got a price, and it's already listed. That SPAC then merges with a company. In the case of IPOB, I think he called it, it was Open Door. Um, now, what happens is the SPAC owns shares before the IPO, just like investors own shares in an IPO before it trades. In a SPAC, the SPAC organizers and their investors own shares before the IPO. And then the IPO trades, and then the price goes up, and the company has the money the SPAC raised, so it gets its money from the SPAC, and the SPAC owners make uh, money, uh, in a good case, on the price of the shares. So that, that's uh, a fact. So, so Chamath is essentially disintermediating Morgan Stanley. Is that one way of thinking of it? Uh, correct. And he's also dis disintermediating growth stage venture capitalists because uh, you'll see that when I tell you the next one. In a direct listing, the company sells shares to venture capitalists before the IPO, um, growth stage venture capitalists. Then the company lists, but without raising money. Then the IPO trades and the shares are priced. In this case, it's the VCs that hold the shares prior to the IPO, and they're the ones that make the money if the price goes up. So the difference here between the green, the orange, and the blue um, is... Who gets to own shares before the IPO? Uh, uh, and the company is in pretty much the same situation, no matter what the answer. So, so the SPAC is disintermedi disintermediating both the banks above and the VCs below. Chamath is basically raising a $600 million fund. And two months later, it owns a publicly listed company. Whereas in a normal fund, he's got to invest it for 10 years and see if it makes a profit. So what's the, um, what's the risk for Chamath, and how, where's he finding his money? Oh, well, from willing investors. And, uh, I mean, they're, they're, uh, think about it. If Chamath came to you and me 
and said, give me $100,000. I'm going to do this SPAC, and we're going to merge with fill-in-the-blank company. Um, and that company is going to trade at something like 3x the price I'm selling to yeah, you. Yeah, but you can't guarantee it. I mean, there can be, you know, it can be a COVID could suddenly erupt or there could be civil war in America. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, there's no guarantee on this. There's, uh, you're right, Andrew. There's no guarantee, but um, he has a track record now. He did Virgin Galactic. So where, where does his money come from then? Is it his own or is he... Uh, it's, it's very similar to where all money comes from. But he's in, essentially a VC. He's, it's a different kind of venture. Is that one way? It is. Going? It's a fast track venture. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, the money... The money comes from the same institutions that give money to IPOs and to VCs. Yeah. And so the bad news on uh, this is a terrible development for, um, I would think, for startup entrepreneurs because the money that would have gone, come to them from VCs now is going to this fast track IPO process where uh, it, it, it's an increasingly a, a winner-take-all uh, venture investment economy. Is that fair? Um, well, I, I think you, if you trace through the logic, the money is coming from the same place. So Fidelity, for example, makes money in all scenarios. So it can yeah. play all three. Uh, yeah, no one, none of us care about Fidelity, right? But we're, what we well, do well, wait, about, wait, wait. Yeah. F- Fidelity is my wife's I, I, you know, investment fund. So, so we kind of do care. Um, uh, uh, the, the pension funds make money in all scenarios. So the only difference is who gets in first. That's the only difference. Does, does Chamath get in first through a spec? SPAC? Do the VCs get in first through a direct listing? Or do the friends of Morgan Stanley get in first through an IPO? That, that's, what's, that's the what, only difference. Can Chamath go to a, a VC back company to do this SPAC? Uh, absolutely, the, the 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 you know the VCs who already own shares in a company, uh, as long as the company and this is a really important point, as long as the company is ready to go public, and and Thomas Tungers this week has a fantastic uh, article um, about uh, about uh, when you should go public. Uh, if I if I put this on, you'll see. Uh, this is a. Oh, let me zoom in. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, but he basically uh, explains what's the difference between Snowflake, which is trading at 112 times its forward-looking revenue, and Sumo Logic, which is trading at 10 times its revenue. Um, he makes the point that there is a, a, a an equation, which he explains why, that will tell you why a company trades at a much higher multiple of their revenue than another company. If your company is ready to go public based on on, on this kind of um, way of thinking, then any VC will embrace us back. But why can't hey, so? So I got a couple of questions. So you still haven't really answered my question about startups because there's only a certain amount of money in the system, and if it's going on SPACs, it's not going in investment on startups. Uh, but but secondly, um, wh- why can't wh- why why won't each VC have a a SPAC department or a SPAC piece. It's just another piece of the process, right? Well, I, I think, Andrew, you're describing the likely future there. I think I think it would make no sense for most VCs not to have a SPAC department in the future. I, I do think that um, SPACs are getting companies going public earlier. So, for example, no, normally when a company goes public in the past, historically, its rate of growth annually at that point is usually around 20 to 40% annual growth. Uh, Snowflake is growing at 200% annually. So it gets a much bigger multiple of its revenue because it's growing so fast. And so what's happening is IPOs, which historically have been happening quite late, SPACs and direct listings are giving them a way to happen earlier. And because the growth is so high, investors want to own the shares because they're going to go up. Uh, and so there's really a, a fundamental structural reorganization of money deployment happening here. I have to say, though, that whenever I hear these schemes described by people like you as being no risk and everyone's guaranteed huge returns, uh, I'm always 
enormously suspicious. We're going to have to play the tape back to see if I actually said that. Um, but but if I did, I'm well, wrong. Well, where's the risk then? No, the, no, the, 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 there's, well, put it this way. There's no risk in growth. So the fundamental is... Well, that goes without saying. But yeah, what, happens so the, they, what happens if they invest in some... Piece, what happens if they do a, a SPAC of some, you know, the equivalent in 2020 of petfoods.com? Then it will flop and people will get... And, and by the way, there are a lot of SPACs, hundreds, and many of them will be thinking of doing exactly that, the, the unscrupulous ones. And uh, naive investors who don't do their research... Or the Paul will, Ryans of the world who are pouring into this SPAC space who have no idea really on innovation or tech or anything like this. Yeah, if Paul Ryan hooks up with uh, what is effectively... You know, not a, not necessarily literally, but probably con man like, secondhand car salesman like, he will ruin his reputation. He doesn't on have a reputation, be, and and I don't think anyone, even especially early on a Friday morning, wants to think about hooking up with Paul Ryan. So, Keith, you you summarize this in your newsletter wonderfully in terms of the winners and the losers from this. Essentially, it's Chamath versus the banks, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'll put the quote up. This is from the newsletter. Um, uh, I make the point that instead of gifting cash to the friends of Morgan Stanley, this method gives cash to Chamath and his friends. So basically, as I said, Chamath is disintermediating the banks. And this is a real threat to the Morgan Stanleys of the world, this, this SPAC thing. It, it, well, if everything went to SPACs, Yes, although I suspect they're clever enough to then start raising SPACs for Chamath. I, I, I would guess that Morgan Stanley and themselves uh, in this, you know, the best capitalists of, of course, the ones who are able to quickly reinvent themselves, and they've reinvented themselves many times over however long they've existed, so they can have their own SPAC department. Correct. And then what about just going back to the, 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 the poor entrepreneur, the startup guy? Me at now.tv. Does this make any difference to me or is this so far down the line it's not even worth thinking about? Um, it doesn't make a difference to you until you are somewhere close to 100 million plus in annual revenue. Okay. Um, uh, up until that point, uh, the, we haven't, I haven't covered it this week, but there are a lot of developments in early stage, seed stage investing. Right. Um, the most unattractive stage right now is the venture stage in between seed and growth. Um, uh, a lot of money stays away from that. But the seed stage, for example, Bain Capital just um, uh, has recently been doing a, quite a bit of seed stage investing. My good friend, Aref El Ali, just joined them to be part of that. Uh, in our increasingly divided 2020 world of increasing chasm between the wealthy and everybody else and the disappearance of the middle, a winner-take-all economy and society, are the SPACs going to compound that even more? Well, all, I think all money deployed in early stage public companies makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. Um, now, that said, and, and by the way, the SEC rules protecting investors from themselves basically prevents you from playing all the way through to an IPO because you don't qualify. So, um, and that's, that's rational, of course. Um, you do want to protect people from losing all their money on a gamble. Um, now, uh, so yeah, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. There, there are a couple of initiatives that could help there. One is Eric Reese long-term stock exchange. Mm. And the other is uh, Carter, the company Carter has a, next week will launch something called Carter X, which is a stock exchange for private companies. Um, and both should, and, and, and then there's also Angel List, which is for syndicates, although you do have to be a qualified investor. Um, so that, you know, crowdfunding in short. So there are attempts to address it, but I think fundamentally the rich are going to get richer, the poor are going to get poorer. That was the week that was, would never be that was the week that was if we didn't mention TikTok. What's happened this week on the TikTok front, Keith? Um, yeah, tick, 
TikTok um, is ticking and talking. I think would be the right the right way to say this. Um, the uh, the on again, off again ban, um, which is basically uh, a platform war between China and the USA. You could think of it as that. Who's going to own social media? Um, if the answer is TikTok, Trump wants it to be American, and nothing in the deal that Oracle has brokered with Walmart makes it American. Basically, ByteDance, the primary shareholder, remains the majority and, and promises to IPO within a year. Um, uh, and that, for Trump at least, doesn't cut it. So Trump threatens that he's going to ban them as of last Sunday. Then he didn't. And, um, I, you know, my personal opinion is governments are increasingly powerless to... Um, to deal with global social media platforms. Um, I, I, I literally don't believe the technology exists to really make a government effective. Yeah. So if they did ban TikTok, you know, I know my kids wouldn't uninstall it mm -hmm. and the data wouldn't stop flowing to it because the internet's global. Tell that to the, 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 the internet user in China who wants to use Google or Facebook or Twitter. I don't buy that. I think the reverse is true. But this is a, uh, an argument we've been having uh, ongoing. And I, I don't know why Trump is even wasting his time with TikTok. No one cares. I mean, he doesn't care either, except for political capital. And it's so confusing that it doesn't seem to be making any difference to the debate, to the election, do you think? Well, you know, there, there, here's the article, by the way. Um, this, this concept of lasting consequences is kind of interesting. Um, it, it, it makes the point that um, America's strategic interest is in being a partner of China, not an enemy. Um, and that America really can't win if it chooses to make China an enemy for economic reasons, of course, militarily, it's a completely different discussion and it wouldn't be good for anyone. But just purely economically, America can, can only win by slowing China down and it can only slow China down by embracing and engaging with it and benefiting from the growth of its market, by the way, through, it, through exports. So uh, the long-term consequences of TikTok for the global partnership between China and America. It's almost like one, one world economy, two major powers, soon to be three with India. It, 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 it kind of frames everything. It's, it's amazing, good. Keith, you talk about two major powers, the US and China, and then a third India. You, I don't think you forgot about Europe, but you didn't mention Europe. And the startup of the week this week does touch on this with one of Europe's few entrepreneurial superstars, Daniel Ek. What's Daniel been up to and why do you give his initiative startup of the week this week? So Daniel is, um, is an interesting guy. Um, he's had a pretty bad week, by the way, because Apple announced Apple One, which will definitely impact Spotify's growth. Um, he's announced that um, of his total net worth, which is as of today, roughly three and a half billion dollars, he's going to invest a billion of it in European startups, specifically European startups. And um, he speaks to something that I've been involved with for quite a number of years now with my fund ADV in, in London, which is the funding gap in Europe compared to America. Uh, Europe under invests 3x compared to America in startups. And it's because people like Daniel don't exist. You know, here we've got Max Levchin, who this week got the deal of the week when his company Affirm got funded. And Max Levchin has invested hundreds of millions in startups. Um, Daniel is saying he's going to do the same in Europe. And, and I think it's, um, it's time for European entrepreneurs that do well to start um, helping the ecosystem grow so there's more of them in the future. So I think it's great. I met him start up the week because I really approve of what, what he's doing. The amount of conversations I've had over the last 15 years, particularly in Europe on this subject, and I don't know the reasons, they're partly cultural, partly political, partly economic, but I just don't see Europe. Europe should focus on tourism, 
on good food and civilization, not worry about tech. Look at this bit here. He says, I get really frustrated when I see European entrepreneurs giving up on their amazing visions, selling early to non-European companies, or when some of the most promising tech talent in Europe leaves because they don't feel valued here. Now, that that is, you know, me. I left London after doing an IPO, by the way. I did an IPO in 96. I left in 97 because the experience in America of how you get treated as an entrepreneur versus Europe was night and day. And it still is, actually. I, I know why you really left, Keith, is because you wanted to get near to your, your heartthrob, Paul Graham, who is back on the show. We haven't had Paul on the show for a few weeks, but I knew that he would reappear. You have him as the tweet of the week. What has Paul Graham been tweeting about this week? He, uh, let's show it. Uh, Paul is, um, Paul says, the number of people working hard on this election is inspiring. It's like a giant collective immune response. And uh, of course, the virus that we're responding to is Trump. And um, he's, uh, his uh, characterization of millions of people knocking on doors or voting by mail as an immune response, I just thought was brilliant. So, um, so uh, to come back to one of your other pieces that you cite in your newsletter, uh, to, to misquote Orwell, some of these people are more important than others. Uh, 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 Reid Hoffman has been incredibly involved on the the funding and the political side in terms of driving the, the democratic side of the election, which isn't making everybody, surprise, surprise, happy. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's actually a great article. Um, uh, uh, let me get it out while I'm talking. But Reid Re Re basically is trying to win the election for the Democrats without partnering with the Democratic Party at the, at the federal level. And um, he's having some success, actually. He was very much involved in the Virginia race that the Democrats won uh, in a shock result uh, about a year ago, I think it was. So, um, yeah, Reed, Reed is um, Reed's very, very, very controversial in the Democratic Party because of that. His, uh, it's really his, astonishing because uh, for those people who know Reed Hoffman, he's the least offensive person imaginable. He's the, he's the antithesis of his... Uh, I don't know if he's still a friend, his ex-friend, Peter Thiel. Yeah. Well, he's, you know, what, what Reid is doing is trying to fund um, lasting change in, in, in the ability of the Democrats to use data and money to properly target deployment of data and money to win elections. And, you know, he's, he, he's treating it like a, a product development um, exercise in a startup. And uh, he's 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 very good at that, as his history proves. Um, I would say, Freed, if you're watching this, thank you for sending me a happy birthday card, uh, which he which I got uh, about six weeks ago from him. Uh, and uh, and thank also, thank, every time I've I've spoke to Reed in the last year, he said I can't speak to you because I'm too busy on my election stuff for the last year. Uh, so I haven't spoken or interacted with him really for more than a year um, other than getting a birthday card. And then finally, back to Paul Graham's tweet of the week. Um, are you predicting then, like Paul, I, I'm suggesting that it seems from his uh, tweet that uh, that these people are creating a, a giant collective immune uh, uh, response to Trump, that they are building a vaccine. Is that going to happen? Uh, funnily enough, that a good crossover to in, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to be on the Gilmore Gang. And uh, on the Gilmore Gang, we talk about the election a lot. And um, uh, my point of view has been unchanged now for quite a number of weeks, which is that Biden is going to win both the Electoral College and the national vote by a landslide. Landslide being what, more than 5 percent, 8 percent, 10 percent? Well, depending on uh, certainly more than 5 percent on the national vote. Um, uh, on the Electoral College, it's really hard to do the math, but I think there'll, there'll be a vast number of states that he wins uh, and not many he loses. Well, um, Keith Tier, ever the optimist, predicts the world will go back to normal. I, I'm predicting the reverse, just to 
counter Keith. I think America will descend <laughs> into civil war. The stock market will crash. Paul Graham will disappear and uh, SPACs will destroy the world economy. So that was the week that was for September the 25th. We'll be back next week. Perhaps we might even talk a little bit about the first uh, debate between um, Biden and Trump. And we might also talk about this gr growing activity in D.C. to big tech, I, I, something we didn't talk about this week. I think it's really interesting. Thank you, Andrew. See you next week.